hope all our uh, viewers and listeners are having a great day. And to, to finish off the great day, uh, we're joined, we're delighted to say we're joined by Dr. Kieran Riley. The, he's a um, professor of, of history, uh, 19th century and 20th century Irish history at Maynooth. Kieran, thanks for taking the time out to chat to us this evening. How are you? Good, John. Thanks. Uh, thanks for inviting me on to talk. Yeah. And uh, we timed this well because uh, congratulations are in, in, in order because you won a very prestigious prize at the Listowel Writers Week last week. Can you tell us more about that? Thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks very much, John. Um, yeah, the, the book, Capard, an Irish country house and estate, uh, won the Milson uh, Local Heritage Prize at, at Writers Week. Uh, last announced last Wednesday night. Um, unfortunately, due to everything that's going on in the country uh, this year now, of course, the Writers Week didn't take place. So it's, it's a pity that um, it didn't. It would have been nice to to be there and savor the, the, the experience. Part, and, uh, an Irish country house in the state uh, won the but yeah, it's also a local heritage prize at, at Writers Week. Received right. the news uh, last announced last uh, Wednesday. So, in other words, there's going to be a party, a big, big party at the end of the year when everything goes back to normal, we hope. Yeah, I think they're, they're, they're planning that. And this year was the 50th anniversary for the Writers' Week, so it would have been a big, a big occasion for everyone that attends and, and, and goes to it. So, yeah, I, I think they've, they've plans for, for something big for, for next year. Yeah. And, well, you deserve, you deserve the congratulations, and you definitely deserve a big party, because I was doing my little bit of research here, and you... Um, you pointed out you've done you've done previous books and hopefully we'll get it up on the screen here and now the books you have written prior to your uh, definitive history we have to say definitive history of Capard House uh, nobody's going to take on that task again of doing what you've done it's basically if it's perfect you can't you can't improve on it and I was reading where when you did uh, the history of um, Strokestown House. And you would have put your um, hands on 50,000 documents in the course of uh, getting, getting that book to, to the publication stage. But you, you were saying to me off camera, with Capard House, you had less than 1% of 50,000 uh, documents available to you in the course of doing your research for Capard House. Now, now my math is bad. <laughs> How good is your math? Like how many documents is that in total? Uh, look, it's uh, that was the big challenge. Uh, less than uh, the definitely was far less than five hundred, less than a percent. Um, yeah, looking at the at the when I was writing the Strokestown book um, back, it was finished in twenty fourteen. I would have poured over yeah fifty thousand plus documents over the course of four years on a daily basis, uh, looking through the documents and, and writing that history of the famine period. And uh, then was tasked with this writing the history of, of Capard over 400 years. And in fact, no documents. The big challenge was no documents survived. And that's always the hardest task for, for the historian. Um, you know, you go in search of documents, you go in search of sources, but nothing survived, or more or less nothing survived. Um, that was the big challenge. So it brought me to um, uh, Cheshire uh, archives in England, uh, Scotland, Belfast. Dublin, down to Port Leash, looking for documents, but a lot of the time it just turned up, uh, it was fruitless. Um, and then, you know, you begin to you begin to, to take a different approach to it. Um, so I, I started looking at the other big houses of Leash and, and the big houses in Offaly and, and to see, had they sources about Capard? Were they visiting Capard? Were they mentioning Capard? Um, and looking about in, in a roundabout way, I suppose. And uh, I suppose I was very fortunate to make contact with descendants of the um, of the Pickett family of Capard um, mm. who live in Switzerland today. So some documents turned up um, in Switzerland at, at, a, at a late stage in the process, um, but which I think help tell, the, tell that story a little bit better as well. So um, yeah, it was real detective work, just plowing around for three years, trying to find uh, documents that would um, enrich the, 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 the publication. That's brilliant. So you're, you're like the Sherlock Holmes of Maynooth. <laughs> <laughs> That's it's part of the it's part of the job and it's part of what part of what we love. You know, um, you know history is, is a passion. It's um, I love that. I love 
I love digging about. Now it was at times it was difficult writing this this book, but um, that's that's what you love. That's 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 part of the job. That's part of the process. And of course, the Pigott fa Pigot family themselves, along with other names like the Cosbys, for example, Coots, they these names tend to crop up again and again and again. And of course, the, the Piggots, they were central to the plantation here in the King's County and the Queen's County. What well, what was to be termed the King's mm -hmm. County and the Queen's County? Yeah, the, they're they're the names, they're they're a lot of the people that came. Um, with the Earl of Sussex in, in, in the 1550s um, to plant Leash and Offaly. And Captain John Pickett was one of the one of those men. And he was granted initially about 800 acres of land near Dysart outside Port Leash. And um, it wasn't, I think, until the 1620s that they were granted the land um, over beyond Rose and Alice at, at Capard. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so they established themselves there then. And of course, there's no trace of the piggots in Dysart. Like the, the castle, there's no there's no remnants left of the castle there in Dysart. There's yeah, no, it's it's it's, it's virtually disappeared. It's a, you'll see it mentioned on, on maps, uh, Pickett's Castle. It was known as Pickett's Castle. Um and of course the the first house at Cabard is 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 almost gone or there's no, there's no remnants of it. Um I think the research that I've undertaken here it's probably the third house that we're looking at, but the, the Capar that we know today is, is probably the third construction um, built in the 1790s. 1790s. And of course, there are two Capar houses, just to complicate things. Yes, yeah. The wing as well. The wing as well, yeah. The Dower, the Dower House, um, or what was called the Dower House, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a fantastic building. Uh, it sits... You know, you can see it from miles around there. I think that's what, what makes it so special. Um, yeah. But ho yeah. hopefully our producer now is putting that up on screen. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's, it's, it really is one of the, the, the special houses, special buildings in, in Leash. Yeah, the location is stunning, isn't it? Fantastic setting, yeah. And, and from the house there, you know, and, and these places weren't built by accident. Um, I suppose the, the pickets, they, they built there for defense purposes but also because of the scenic beauty and you know when you look out you, you look across the, the plains of, of the midlands and they say you can see six counties from from the doorstep of Capard on, on a good day on a good day yeah and they got lucky too like not only had they, they had lots of timber on the land i think they were allocated was it over 4250 acres in those yeah, a huge, a huge estate which spread across the across the ridge there and across the mountain, and significantly, it also included a, a quarry. And you know, a lot of the stone for the house was was actually drawn from the quarry, which obviously saved uh, on, on on costs for them. And I think towards the end of the 18th century, Rose and Alice was was well known for its. Uh, uh, stone, you know, and people came from far and, and, and near to to, uh, to get the Rose and Alice uh, quarry stone. Um, you know, it, it was it was well known. Yeah, and of course the, the the Quaker tradition in Rose and Alice is very strong, as it is in Mount Melick. Was there a, a symbiotic relationship between the Piggots in the big house and the village of Rose and Alice? Did they kind of develop lockstep, or was there a bit of friction? No, I haven't come across any friction um, that existed. They, they kind of come together at the same time. Um, the, the, the Quaker settlement there emerges from the 1670s, 1680s onwards. And this is really when the, the pickets start to develop themselves and develop Capard as well. So they're kind of emerging at the same time. And I suppose one of the um, outstanding features of the picket family over several generations was their toleration for different religions. Um, and in particular the Catholic religion as well, because they allowed during the penal era, they allowed um, the local community to worship in the domain. And there was a mass rock there and also to, to worship at a, a local well. There's a well still on the grounds of, of Capard, uh, St. Margaret's Well. And um, they were, you know, they were, they were well taught of for that. And that carried through. You can see that as late as the, as the 1930s when, um, local school children gathered information about the area and about the history of the area. You know, they spoke about the um, the benevolence of the, of the Pickett family for allowing that. Yeah, they have a good they have a good reputation in that regard. They were very um they were very cute though. Like uh, they um 
I read somewhere, now you can tell me if this is complete baloney now, that they found iron ore reserves on their land and uh, they didn't pass up an opportunity and had it smelted by the coots in Mount Rat. Is that true? They did. They, they did. Um, I, I didn't hear the piece about the, the coots of Mount Rat now, but um, they did in the 1830s when uh, one of the John Pickett, he returned from England to take up residency in the house and uh, he decided that he would have an extensive survey done of the uh, of the estate and, and across the ridge, and it it was what many Irish landlords were doing at the time. They were trying to find out where they could get more money, and that was uh, for many of them that was below the soil. Um, and and the pickets tried that, but I don't know whether they were that terribly successful or not in 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 that uh, that venture. Right, right. But I suppose not, nothing ventured, nothing gained. Yeah, yeah. Nothing. Now, with your detective story, trying to piece together um, the history of not only the Pickett family, but of course, Caparit House, um, did, you, did you find that there was a big party, a big house party scene? Because I've, I've read references to it, that, that all the, the, the families of the big houses would be visiting each other. Yeah, yeah. So the, the, the story of, of Capard is really one of um, decline and renewal over several generations, over several decades. So you will have a period of, of renewal and it's quickly followed by decline and, and, and so forth. So I, I think in the 19th century, Capard was a, a popular place amongst the local uh, landed gentry and visiting gentry from the other counties. Um, the, the Duke of Richmond actually was visited Capard Hunt in, in the beginning of the 19th century. I suppose he was probably the, the uh, I suppose the most high profile visitor at, the, at that time. Um, but then it goes into a period of, of, of decline and the family um, moved to the, the inheritors of the, of the estate in the 1660s, 1670s, they moved to Switzerland. So that house scene and house set kind of declines a little bit then. Um, right. but I, I think the outstanding feature of Capard um, was that the domain was always used by the local community um, and they would have enjoyed, uh, they would have had balls and uh, festivals and carnivals and, and so on um, in Capard and in the domain. Um, you know, there was even camogie played there in the 1940s. Um, so it was widely used. Uh, I think I've, 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 I've plenty of references of that in the book. Um, yes. It was also used by couples. Capard was a kind of a favourite haunt as well by, by what was described in the late 19th century as courting couples. Um, right. So it, it, it was very popular from that point of view. But because the house declines and, and goes through these periods, um, it wasn't a, as, as, as I suppose, it wasn't a visiting house um, as others were. Yeah. Now, what's, what's the function of the wing? The house is set a little bit back from the front house. What, what, what was that purpose? Yeah, there's, there's, there's different theories as to what the purpose of the, of the house was. Some people thought it was a, a dower house for, for one of the older um, or, or perhaps one of the widowed um, pickets. It probably, or not that, it just, the parts of the building are definitely date from the 1740s. So we're looking at the second um, construction there. Um, so Southwell Pickett constructed the house um, in the 70, early 1740s after a serious fire at Capard. Mm. And uh, that, that portion of the house was kept when the new building commenced then in the 1790s. Only 50 years later, John Pickett decided that. He wanted to upgrade and, and, and wanted to commence the building of a new uh, a new house. And so it you, uh, uh, employment for 200 locals, didn't it, Karen? Huge employment, yeah, 200 locals. And I said they, that the quarry was used, so there would have been quarrying um, um, stone for, for the building of the house. Uh, that's all interrupted by the 1798 rebellion, then that breaks out. Um, and um, some of its workers, I think, are, are implicated in in the rebellion um, and, and pick, quits the country and, and, and heads for England at that stage. Okay, but he comes back and then um, I think it was William Wilson in 1803 made basically a big splash when he said, like, this is one of the finest houses in the kingdom. Mm -hmm. and yeah. so 
was it, its fame was basically throughout the British Isles at that stage. Yeah, even though Pickett leaves Gepard in a kind of an unfinished state um, in 1798, as you, you rightly say, it was praised by, by Wilson then in 1803. Um, and it was also praised by, by, by more people. Uh, it was widely celebrated for its plantation. Um, Pickett won a medal from the, the, the Dublin Society in 1793 for the plantations at Gepard. And that's the other part that... I suppose Capard will always be known for is, is, is that huge plantation of trees um, and it, it, it singled it out from other houses as well. Yeah, now speaking of other houses, I mean, it's only recently I think we began to appreciate here in, in Leash in the Midlands the, the number and quality of country houses we have in Leash. Yeah, I think Leash is quite fortunate. Um, you know, you have Stradbally, you have Emo, um, you have Roundwood there as well. Uh, you know, there are some fantastic houses in Leash. Leash has spared um, the, 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 the burning mania, I suppose, if you want to call it, of the early 1920s, where, where many of these houses were torched or let fall into room. Um, yeah. Leash, Leash records a, a very low level of, of house burning, so uh, fortunate in that regard that they, they survive. Yeah, very fortunate because uh, as I was mentioning to you off camera here, and I'm from, from Tipperary, South Tipperary, we had a lot of big houses burnt. Thomastown yeah. Castle, which would be only three miles from our house, that was burnt down through that period. It's, it's a terrible shame in a sense. You can understand looking back why it happened. Um, you yeah. can't own it though. Yeah, there's a, there's a variety of different reasons why these houses were, were destroyed. I think about 300 in total destroyed during the three-year period, um, 1920 to 23, and then hundreds more then were destroyed by the Land Commission, um, who were every bit as um, violent in the removal of, of, of country houses. Yeah, they, they were overzealous would be one way of putting it, putting it. what was it, Kieran? Yeah, definitely, yeah. yeah. Oh, what was the thinking behind that? Well, they, they remove, well, for some, it was removing these uh, representations of, of, of a different past. Um, and for others, then, it was more economic to remove the, the rates that were people were likely to incur uh, for having a, a house like that on, on, on land that they had acquired. Um, and others, then, were simply pillaged, um, like rum, rumble through the Midlands there to any of the counties, and you will see... Um, on, on, on farmyards, you, you, you will see um, gate piers that once stood on, on, on the entrance to, to country houses. Correct, correct. Um, a, a little bit of plundering was going on. That's right, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And of course, you mentioned some country houses, but I mean, the list goes on, Alish. I mean, we have Ballantubbert, Ballykilcavan. Yes, like, yeah. you know, I, I'm sure I'm going to get messages now, John. You didn't mention me. You didn't mention me. Yeah, yeah. I, I was uh, afraid well, to leave, leave out someone. I didn't mention Abbey League Cider, of course, which is. Ah, um, uh, yes. You know, I think it's and, something to know them all. A Piggott connection. I didn't know this until today. There's a Piggott connection. I'm just looking at my notes here. There's a Piggott con connection with Abbey Leaks in that there was um, a house there. I can find it here now. He rebuilt Knapton, or is it Knapton House in I believe? Yeah, yeah. They, um, they must have been some uh, branch. I'd say they were of the same branch, um, probably soldiers in that um, plantation phase. Uh, I, I, I could never trace or, or track piece the, the two houses together, but there must have been some connection with them, I'd say. And also, we, we, I mean, Farmley House um, is stunning up in Dublin, but Leash had a Farmley House. And that's it. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's amazing. I, I mean, I like, you know, you're, you're doing research and going, well, geez, I mean, it's it's Capard House and nothing but Capard House. But straight away, you've kind of three branches of the family, three big houses. We're lucky to have Capard House. Mm -hmm. But they're, they, they had an amazing history because when you think about it, I don't want to be too controversial, but John Pickett, going back to the 1550s, you could argue he was a, the right hand man of the Earl of Sussex. And is it true he was involved in that massacre at Mullock Mast? Yeah, the, the, the family are, are, I suppose, over several generations then, they, they carefully construct their own lineage and their own family history and how they come to be in the area. And um, 
part of the reason for that is to, um, I suppose, to atone for, for their behaviour at Mullock Mass when, when so many of the Amours and, and others were, were slaughtered. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't, an, of, put it this way, an auspicious start for the Pigot family in Leash, but I mean, look at their heritage now in, in totality. It's an yeah. incredible heritage, an incredible legacy. It does, and 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 that's I, I start I, I begin the book by by talking about um, an occasion in in Rose and Alice, which I suppose many people people even watching this evening will remember. That was the inaugural festival of the mountain in 1962, and um, I begin by saying that Charles the Jenner, who was himself a, a, his mother was a picket, um, that. Perhaps as he looked out that morning across the domain they, they set up, there was 3,000 people on the domain that morning. Um, perhaps he, it crossed his mind that there were 400 years in the county that year. Um, you know, it, it's, it's an incredible uh, to think that, that the family survived that long um, in, the, in the location. Yeah, it's a lovely thought to think that he, he might have been uh, just aware of that 400th anniversary. Yes, he, he was. We know he he, um, he he opened the house regularly to local groups. Um, the old Leash Society were regular visitors, I think, in the early nineteen sixties. And um, yeah, he was he, he was quite he was quite proud of of, of that uh, heritage that, that the family had, and you know he would have. I think it it, it would have crossed his mind um, on that morning. Yeah, really. I suppose it's only now we're kind of uh, embracing. The big house heritage that we do have. It's yes, a, yeah, it, it's it's only in that the, there's been a real, um, I suppose, explosion is the, the, the wrong word to use <laughs> in the context of what we've been talking about. But um, there's a great interest, yeah, there definitely is in the last. Um, there's a greater appreciation of country houses, um, and I think that's the, the the hope with a book like this and Capard is that people will see just how important, like Capard House was vital for the social, cultural and economic prosperity of Rose and Alice and you could argue Mount Melick as well because it, it gave great employment um, and there was an economy back and forth between the, the merchants and the shopkeepers of Mount Melick and Rose and Alice and the house. Um, and then the social, the social aspect of it I've, I've highlighted already about the, the various use of the domain and so on. Um, so yeah, there were integral parts of the, of the local landscape local landscape and of course I mean the countless families that were supported through really really bad times yeah yeah and I think um it's, it's interesting looking at the at the at the rentals of um the one rental that does survive um from the from the estate from I think as far back as 1806 or 1807 and some of the names that are mentioned on that rental are still in the locality so they too have survived um uh, along with the pickets and others there. Yeah, because you're, you're, you're talking about surnames, obviously from Tipperary, I mean, we weren't planted to the same extent as Leash and Offaly. And you get names here, surnames here, that obviously the locals are so used to it. But, you know, you don't get it anywhere else. I'm thinking like in terms of Ramsbottoms, as I mentioned, the Coots before, Cosby's, mm. you don't really get them that uh, much elsewhere in the country. No, you still you see it you see it in Leash and, and parts of Offaly definitely. The, the, those names, um, those plantation names are, are are there to be found everywhere. But at the same time, there are plenty of of the uh, the native Irish that were supposedly driven out of Leash and Offaly uh, at this point. Um, they remained they remained there because they needed them. They needed them to farm the land. They needed them to. Um, uh, for work as well, so they, they do remain in the area. And for, like uh, Karen, you're, you're from Eden Derry. What, but what what gets what gets an awfully man to do an incredible, incredible history of Capard House? Like what 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 sparked your interest in the house? Can you remember the first time even coming across the name and going, "There's something here." Well, I, I was I was I was asked to to um, to look into the history of the house in 2015. Uh, it's somewhere I had been, um, I think about 18 months or two years prior to that, I had, on a kind of a road trip, I had visited a lot of the houses of, of South Offaly and, and over the border into Leash. And I remember um, 
arriving at the gates of Caparl and, and, and didn't actually get access that day. But um, it's somewhere that it just fascinates straight away. I remember the first day visiting the house then um, in, in 2016. And um, it's just, the, as I said earlier, the vista from the house is, is spectacular. The house itself is, is a remarkable building. And then when you start to, to research the, the, the history, the different, the different episodes um, of, of the house's history, like when, when if you're standing outside Capard, um, one of the first things that you, you, you'll see is the, um, the bullet holes. The house, the facade of the house is peppered with bullet, um, holes. bullet holes. I think there's nearly 190 bullet holes that are still there from an event that happened 98 years ago during the, the Civil War. It's um, incredible. Well, yeah, just some fascinating aspects of its, of its past. That, you know, it just it really intrigued me. Yeah, it's it's living, living, breathing history. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, of course, if we could ever get permission to have a, a drone fly over and do a sweeping shot through the grounds, I mean, that's obviously for another day. That would be incredible. It, I mean, basically, it would be huge, uh, huge promotional value for Leash Tourism and for the local economy. Just to, even for locals mightn't even know the, the extent of the grounds and the grandeur of the grounds and the buildings. It's, uh, we're very lucky to have it, mm -hmm. Kieran. We're very lucky to have it. And speaking of lucky, we're very lucky that you took on this, this onerous task. We really, really do appreciate it. And uh, have, you any, um, have you any kind of inkling as to what you're going to write about next? Will, <laughs> you, stay, will you stay at leash, Kieran? Please. Um, <laughs> well, I'm, at the moment, I'm, I'm, I suppose for a while now, I've been writing, you always kind of writing things um, in conjunction with, with whatever you're doing. Um, I'm, I'm looking now at the famine. I'm back immersed in, in famine documents and, and looking at... Um, I suppose boring down to, to the local community level, what actually happened uh, across the country, not just the Midlands, um, looking at what happened in, in, in a variety of different communities. Um, I suppose that the famine is, is such a huge area of, of interest to people, um, but we've still an awful lot to learn um, and to understand about it. And, and I think that's the next big task that, that I'm undertaking. That's, that's a huge one, a huge one. But uh, having witnessed your detective skills on the Capert House book, I'm sure you'll be, you'll be more than able to pull off uh, another magisterial uh, book on, fam on, on the famine period in this area and in other uh, local areas. So, um, Kieran, I have to say, thanks for taking the time out for the chat this evening. Really do appreciate it. You're welcome. Um, nice hope, your family, hope your family are all well. The two oh, well, wife and the two boys and uh they're in claim now that is yeah but you, you even though you're over in kildare you're, you're awfully true and true you you kicked minor under 21 and senior football for awfully <laughs> uh, a long no. time ago. <laughs> a long time ago now the football days are, 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 are well and truly over but um yeah look um i'm an awfully man living here in kildare and um yeah, the, I, 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 as often as I can, my work will will try and return to uh, returns to Offaly, um, and I think that's what's kind of sometimes research can be hard and it can be um, it can be kind of onerous to, to to start something new. But when you when you can tie it to the local, it it, it helps. Yeah, always keep it local, Kieran. Now, and Kieran, thanks for taking uh, time out of your busy schedule to come into us this evening, and enjoy enjoy. Hopefully, what's going to be a great great summer and hopefully the, the present the present problems we're going through will uh, soon soon lift and dissipate thank, thank you john thank you and uh, the best best of luck to you as well thank you see you later Cheers, john. thanks